We'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am speaking with my dear friend Peter Powell from his uh, home up in uh, Lang Lancaster. And uh, uh, Peter, I, I, I really would like to spend some time talking with you a little bit about growing up up there but uh what i what i hope we focus on at least uh pretty intently is is just the whole notion of community because to me you are representative of uh <clears throat> what i think is the greatest hope for us in the future and that is restoring a sense of community um to each of us, you know, within our, within our various areas and communities. But um, uh, am, am I wrong to say that this, that this has always been, at least as long as I've known you, uh, a central focus of your life, the idea of community? Well, it really has. And I, I, um, as you know, I, my background involved being in DC for several years, working on the Senate Commerce Committee staff. And then I came home for a campaign and then had to decide following that, whether to go back to DC or to do what I really had been thinking about since I was about 12, and that was moving up north. And if I was going to move up north, what would I do for a living? And how would I pursue life here? I was not yet married, I was engaged. Um, and I, I made the decision not to go back to the city, which I had kind of, of um, tied up, and to come to the country, which is what I thought about all the time that I was in the city. So I came north, and um, as a naive kid, 27, I think, and um, was trying to figure out what to do. And my dad said, well, how about real estate, which he had played with through his adult life, I guess. And um, and I said, well, I don't want to be a sales, salesperson. I'd been out saving the world and and uh, was involved in the US Senate campaign, which I came back to do in DC. And, uh, and he said, well, who are you to say that about another man's profession about which you know nothing? And I said, well, gosh, that's pretty hard hit. <laughs> maybe, maybe he's right. And what I've learned is that we are all salespeople because every time we attempt to do anything for anyone, we first have to gain their confidence. And in order to be a participant or to lend advice um, or to get someone to do something that you think might be in their best interest, then they have to have confidence in you. They have to trust you and we sell ourselves. And then whatever notion we're up against, whether it's a candidate or a product or a service. So that's kind of a learning process I've been through. But surrounding all of my my work, which has been the real estate business for 50 years now, and I'm, I'm in my office. Um, and I was born in Concord, grew up in Hampton Falls, and came up here 50 odd years ago, just over 50 years. Um, but I, when I think of community, I think of Steve Taylor, who was our former commissioner of agriculture, and, and a comment he made on the Laura Canoy show once. I don't know if I was driving or, or sitting at home and I heard about it, and I heard it uh, air. But Laura asked Steve and the fellow he was on her show with, who happened to be the Commissioner of Agriculture from Vermont, what she, what they thought the differences were between our two states. And Steve's reply was, well, I'll tell you one thing. If you ask Fred over here, or whatever his name was, uh, where he's from, he'll tell you he's from Vermont. If you ask me, I'll tell you I'm from Plainfield. And that sort of describes um, the New Hampshire condition, I think, a little bit. And it is something that we have suffered from to a degree. Um, and that is a, sort of a lack of a sense of statewide community. 
And I think it's a very big problem. I think it has been for a while, north versus south and coast versus mountains and so forth and so on. It's a small state, um, but it's hard to get your around, arms around the whole thing at once. And I, and I believe that a lot of my involvements have been born in an effort to try to get greater understanding and participation of folks in the North Country with folks from other places. And here in my hometown of Lancaster, I, I've been involved, but I early on got, got um, drawn into the statewide nonprofit community and I've had a lot of involvements over the years. And, uh, and I'm pleased with that. It's been really more important to me than, I never intended to be a, a, a business person, to um, have a business career. Um, that just happened. But what I have always felt strongly about is policy and public matters and things that affect people of all ages and stages and circumstances. And, uh, and that's really where our nonprofit community lives and, and where a lot of community is built around, around those giving organizations and institutions. You you grew up in a in a political household. What did, uh, tell folks about your dad and um, and your mom and what what it was like to grow up in that house? Well, uh, we're talking a long time ago. Uh huh. It's been a, been a, a number of years since my dad passed, which was in 1981. My mom just passed in 2017. Um, she was just a few weeks short of being 99. Dad wow. was only 65. Um, but yes, it was an active and busy house. Um, and in the days when New Hampshire probably had about 500,000 people as a population, um, it was still as vital and, and robust and complex as, as any other place, despite size. Um, but probably a little um, easier to um, raise a family in the context of, of a political life. We, we didn't change our roots. We, there was no such thing as a governor's mansion in New Hampshire at that time. Um, don't know that we would have been there anyway. We stayed in Hampton Falls. I went to high school, uh, public high school, and, and um, lived a, a relatively normal life. I think it started when I was in seventh or eighth grade and finished when I was 16. He was governor for two terms from January of 69 to January of 59, excuse me, to January of 63. He was a very independent, um, strong, compassionate and caring individual. Um, he was a Republican. At a, in a time when Republicans were of a different sort than we think of them today. Um, it was the, the good days, I think, of, of um, party politics in, in New Hampshire, um, as was the case when I was working in DC with Norris Cotton and others on the Commerce Committee staff. People got along, they cared about each other. They may have had opposing points of view, but generally speaking, knew that the common good was the common purpose and found a way to arrive at that, not without controversy, not without a lot of hard work, but with, but with I think, better attitudes than we see among opposing parties today. Um, and in my home, it was a place where um, there was constant in and out, lots of people coming and going all the time. Um, we occasionally had to be paraded out as, as the kids of, of the governor, I remember one, very embarrassing time. He was asked to uh, to speak at a church on a Sunday, and uh, and we were asked to line up afterwards and sign autographs. So here I was, as a twelve year old kid, saying, "What do you want my autograph?" <laughs> <laughs> and I and I remember also spending a period of time adjusting and not wanting to be West Powell's kid. You know, I was just Peter, and, and uh, that's how I wanted to be known. And um, so sometimes I deny a connection just because I didn't want to be singled out within a you know, crowd of kids. And um, you, 
get over that after a while. And I, I, uh, I was very proud of my dad, not because he was perfect or always right, but he was so hardworking, so dedicated, and as I said before, so compassionate. Um, he made his mistakes like we all do, but boy, what a what a wonderful person he was. He he grew up in Puddle Dock in Portsmouth, um, back when it was the other side of the tracks. And if you were in an immigrant from another country, as as uh, his folks were from Newfoundland, which was then part of England when they came, um, huh. you you assimilated. You know, you you learned to live with others. You learned that you were no better than anybody else, and no one else was better than you. And that's how he lived his life in defense of those who needed that defense. And uh, you also learned how to handle yourself, and it wasn't always. Uh, with your tongue or your brain. Sometimes it was with your fists. For those who don't know what Portsmouth used to be like in those days. <laughs> and there are lots of stories and they carried forward. You know, I have some wonderful stories about my father, but that could take at least a day. And I'm here, here to share some of them if you want. But um, he was just a very unique and wonderful person. My mom, um, people used to say, uh, well, if you don't like, not everybody will love Wes, but nobody fails to love Beverly. She was just a gracious and, and very, again, a caring and wonderful person who you would never know had a hard day, you know, to meet her. But she certainly did have her days. And she went through a political life more reluctantly, perhaps, but so with such charm and, and so beautifully done. Um, she was magnificent. She came from Concord up in East Concord. Her father worked in a foundry. Her mother worked at, um, um, oh my goodness, the, the, the publishing company in Concord for over 50 years. They used to do the Reader's Digest, and that was their assignment, was to, was to put the print together on her monotype machine for the Reader's Digest. And I don't know why that company's name just flew out of my head, but it did. Um, huh. So, she grew up uh, during the Depression in part. Uh, the only meat that she would eat was if, was what my father, my grandfather went out to shoot. And that's where their meat came from. So dad was dad was one of, uh, she was an only child. Dad was one of seven that survived childbirth, six boys and a girl. And um, growing up in the streets of, of Portsmouth and, and the Puddle Drop area, um, he, uh, he never lost his roots. He was always proud of them. And uh, and that included New Hampshire roots as well as, as those in, in Portsmouth. I uh, don't know what else to do. I could go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, Puddle Dock was a pretty tough place it was. in those days. Yeah, I'll tell you one story. You can you can take it out if you don't want it. But dad dad became very successful. He was in his 40s when he was elected. Uh, he was successful in life, you know, as an attorney, um, but he uh, he probably would have been more so if he didn't have such a passion for politics and public service. <laughs> but um, he had been in office, I think, one term, and then uh, was nominated to be president of the Council on State Governments and chairman of the New England Governors Conference. And then at a, at a conference, I believe, in Hawaii, he was um, nominated to be chairman of the governor's conference um, in opposition to Nelson Rockefeller, who wanted very much to be to have that position because he wanted it as a stepping stone to a presidential run. So this might have been even 59 in the early days or, or early huh. in, earlier in 1960. And um, it was quite an interesting thing because the, the uh, chairmanship alternated between Republicans and Democrats in May still. And it was a Republican term. And dad was a young guy and he had a lot of other young guys like Mark Hatfield and Fitz Hollings and uh, people who became senators and, and things later in their lives. Um, and they were supported. So he was supported by a bunch of um, younger Republicans who, who weren't in favor of Rockefeller and by a bunch of Democrats who didn't want Rockefeller to be recognized in that way. So um, 
it was a pretty pretty earnest little session and it culminated at a big banquet in a big hall and they both gave their remarks and in those days people would would you know in sessions of any kind would have a scotch where they don't do those things anymore which is good but dad uh, at the end of it um he excused himself to go to the men's room and he uh got up from the table the head table and he walked down this hall and all of a sudden a, a very large trooper from new york stepped out in front of him and he stopped him and he and the trooper said to my father excuse me governor um but the governor wants to speak to you and he motioned behind him and there was nelson over in a, in a little corner in the hallway and dad knew what was going on he wanted to work some kind of a deal and dad wasn't about to do that so he said well i don't want to talk to the governor and uh and he started to walk past the trooper and the trooper put his hand on this kid from huddled up on his shoulder to stop him and dad said whipped his hand off him and he said oh, oh the, the trooper said you don't understand i said the governor wants to talk to you and my father said as he whipped his hand off his shoulder you don't understand i don't want to talk to the governor so he went into the men's room and he went up to the urinal and he was doing his thing when someone else came into the men's room and it was a, a, a gentleman whose name i don't recall who worked for a new york paper that i i can't speculate which one it was because i don't remember and i don't know if he told me um but he he stood somewhat behind my father and said uh, governor powell i just want you to know that if you don't get out of this race you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to start reading things about yourself that you were that you will wish were not there so my father said, is that right? And he finished his duty and zipped himself up, if I can say so, and turned around and said to the reporter, or whatever he was, um, you write anything you want. Do you remember to tell them the one thing? And during the war, he was badly wounded and had nothing, no strength in his left hand, but his right was double the double the, the cost of the left. Um, he hauled off and clocked the guy, gave him a gave him a punch in the jaw, and he went back to the wall, flew back to the wall, dropped to the floor, and dad said, uh, don't forget the time on some puddle dot. <laughs> the next day they had the vote. He was elected chairman of the National Governors Conference. There was nothing in any paper anywhere. So it was a two punch night i guess <laughs> but that's that's just a good story about west powell he was he was tough he was independent he was strong resilient um came up with an awful lot of opposition over the years it, it was pretty rough um in difficult days uh, as a family during some of those uh, controversies involving his not appointing the right person, according to Mr. Loeb, to the United States Senate, um, and it got, got to be pretty nasty. But he uh, never lost his independence. He never lost his compassion for his caring for others. That was the foundation to everything. And uh, and I'm really proud of, of his service and of but who he was. You know, it isn't the fact that he was governor. It isn't. He did some great things then, and there are some great stories. But it was the journey. You know the wasn't the brass link ring it was the it was the trip around the matters around but really i'm proud of and it's history yeah there's the journey as you say the journey yeah. the journey yep it, that's how we are defined right yes well we're a collection of our stories i, I was on a humanities council board and, and a wonderful experience um back during gosh i don't know the late 90s, I think, and um, early twos. And um, it was a great great chance for people who worked in other things as I did to, to get your head in a better place during your meetings and worked with wonderful people on the board. But my walk away was that all any of us are is a collection of our stories. It can be our personal stories, our family stories, even later the stories of our kids, but that's who we are is where we've been and what we've done. 
Now, those were the days, of course, of uh, when uh, uh, William Loeb was at sort of the height of his his powers. What was what was it like dealing with William Loeb for your father? Well, he uh, I think they used each other a little bit or tried to because it was an on again, off again relationship. It started out when dad ran for the Senate as a kid, he was 32 or 33. He came home from Washington in 1949, where he was chief of staff for Bridges after, before and after the war. Um, he had spent a year in hospital, went back to Bridges' office, and then was healed up, began his family, um, I guess, before, he, before going back to D.C. Um, Loeb. I think started out feeling excited about this young guy, the spectrum who came back and, and was getting people excited. He was running against Charles Toby, who was the incumbent, long shot. Um, and dad all, and he supported dad because he was independent and so forth and so on. And then uh, that that was, I guess, a, an on, on again and off again relationship. I came across a file of correspondence some years ago, and I was really shocked and interested by how formal any correspondence was between my father and Loeb. It was measured, it was uh, well written, but I could tell slightly cautious. And I think I think uh, what what finally happened was when when Styles Bridges passed away, Dad was in office and he had to appoint a successor, and Loeb and others wanted his third wife, Dolores, his widow, to be appointed. And um, for reasons that he said, I'll take to the grave, and he did. He would not do so, and he appointed Mo Murphy, who was a, a close friend and had been a, uh, gosh, his, his uh, legal advisor when he was in office and so forth, and just a wonderful person. And uh, he nominated Mo, Mo went down and served. But it it was a very costly thing politically, and um, just turned into a big row. Uh, Dad had had uh, sponsored or or led a major reorganization of state government as one of his major major programs when he was in office, and it was a real battle. I think he took, if I'm remembering the literature correctly, I think he took something like two hundred departments and commissions and agencies and, and consolidated and whittled them down to a couple of dozen. And um, the Department of Safety and, and uh, Dred Resources and Economic Development, which has been changed again. Uh, just a number of things. And um, that was very controversial. It, it involved change and changes often met with resistance. And um, he had been opposed by some of those who ended up running against him. And uh, following following his defeat in the primary at the end of his second term, he he, he was running for a third. Um, John Tosley was nominated, and Dad didn't feel he could support him, so he supported John King, who was a Democrat. And that began an interesting history of change between the parties in New Hampshire. Um, he just you know, the, the, I in the Quran it is said that in order for a life to be complete, you have to have a child, plant a tree, and write a book. So I, I've had three wonderful children, take care of an awful lot of trees, but I got to write a book and, and to, to cover the life of my dad because it was so extraordinary and different than the lives I have today in politics and in life. And uh, just a remarkable journey. So I can't recap all of those things very well in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a short conversation, but his relationship with Loeb as the uh, tour de force in New Hampshire and the, the uh, kingmaker and so forth, the fellow who had his controversial editorials on the front page and um, who um, really controlled a lot of the news as it went around. And we had one statewide newspaper in those days and it was the Union Leader different paper today and a different environment today. Um, so much has changed. Yeah. He was, he was, um, I think,
think in the end they, they weren't real good friends. Yeah. <laughs> Put it that way. So are you writing a book about him, Peter? It is my ambition to do so. I hope so, yes. Oh, that would be that would be wonderful. I, mean, I, I st I'm still working. And I need to uh I need to um stop working and start writing. <laughs> <laughs> so and it's it's going to be going to be uh I'm, I'm glad i haven't done it yet because i think it was such an emotional thing when he passed it would have been um too sentimental and and, and not um as objective i think in, in in the years that have followed but it's it's really just the stories of his life it isn't trying to match up any great list of accomplishments or anything. It's just just a good life, a good and remarkable life. So it's worth sharing. Yeah. Well, I, I, I look forward to reading it. <laughs> yeah, I hope. Well there's there's a goal. I'll get it done. Now yes yeah, you're you're gonna have me pestering you about it for the next 10 years anyway. <laughs> well, that's good. That gives us both 10. We need them. <laughs> Yeah, it would be nice if to have that. <laughs> oh wow! So, so what was it that kind of uh, you you went off to? How did you get the job in in uh, in in Washington with the Senate? Um, graduated from college in '68 and took a trip around the country with a couple of friends. Came back in August of '68. And, and got involved in a campaign and um, gubernatorial campaign. And during that time, um, I spent some time on the stump speaking. And um, and I'm condensing an awful lot of stuff here. But um, <laughs> one of the one of the folks who was also on the stage was Louis Wyman. And uh, Louis said to me one day, "You know, if you ever want any experience." call me up because I'd love to have you in D.C. So the campaign ended. Um, I went to work as the editor and publisher, the sole, sole employee of the River News and Twin State Times up in Woodsville, down in Woodsville for me, uh, <laughs> for about a year. It was a, it was a paper that my father had owned. Uh, he had owned the Hampton Union and the Beacon in Portsmouth which happened serendipitously because a dear friend at CB had a heart attack with his family down at Hampton Beach and passed away. And his wife, Peg, was left with the paper to get out. The papers don't care if you, you know what happens to you. You better get them done. So dad just jumped in and started helping her every week. And she turned to him one day, as I recall the story, um, and said, Wes, I, I just can't do this. Would you take the paper over? So he agreed to do it, and one reason was that he was out of office. He was still he was practicing law, but he was out of office, and uh, and I knew he was enjoying the enjoying probably in fact, and also the idea of being able to editorialize and have a little fun, which he did with a column called uh, "Around the Big Wheels" by a spokesman, and, <laughs> and the logo was a broken wagon wheel stuck in the ground. And the theme that he often carried was the conversations between the seagull from from the coast flying up and around and talking to the eagle on top of the dome in the uh, in Concord. <laughs> and um, and he had great fun with it. A lot of people picked it up. Um, it was a pretty pretty good battle back and forth all the time with Loeb and 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 those folks. But he uh, he did enjoy it for quite some time. But during that time, he got a call from his wonderful and good friend and mine, uh, T. Borden Walker of Woodsville, who was just salt of the earth, wonderful, wonderful person. And um, Borden called him up one day and he said, Wes, Evelyn's going to retire. He's just going to stop the paper. We can't lose our paper here in Woodsville. Would you pick it up along with that one you got in Hampton and keep it going? And he said, sure. So he did. And we had some employees there. My brother was there for a time before I went. Um, but he had sold the union in Hampton and, and the Beacon in Portsmouth and the uh, 
flyer and so forth that he was doing. And uh, and this was the only thing he had left that he wanted to sell it because he just wasn't into it anymore. So when I got back and the campaign was over, he said, Sam, my brother wants to uh, do something else. Uh, I'm going to try to sell this, get a couple suitors. Um, would you go up and run the paper until it's done? So Sam had some help. I didn't have any help. I had three days to learn how to put a paper out, <laughs> literally, and I did. And um, and that was a heck of an experience. I learned how important the press is, how important the local papers are. It's the heartbeat of a community when utilized well. And it, and it grieves me to see so many disappearing and struggling, but a tremendously important part of any community. Talk about community where we started boy, how essential it is to have the involvement and the eyes on the heartbeat of the community to share with others what's going on and to bring voices forward that otherwise wouldn't be heard. So that was a great experience. I did it for 10 or 11 months. And then the paper got sold and I helped the new owner in a transition. His name was Powell, but no relation. Also a very nice guy. It became part of the Bradford opinion down in Bradford, Vermont. So they meshed them together, I believe. Um, so I was pondering, what do I do next? And um, and I, so I said to my father, well, Louis had offered me a position. He said, well, call him up, check it out. Because my dad had been chief of staff for Stiles Bridges, which made him also chief of staff for the Senate Appropriations Committee back in the 40s. My mom, was working in Bridges' office. She she lived up the hill, and Bridges' house was down the hill in East Concord. She was the babysitter for, for his kids. Um, and uh, he offered her a position first in the, he was in the public service office, I think, in Concord, and then, then he was elected to, then he was governor, and then he went down to D.C., and, and she went down with him. And uh, that's where mom and dad met and started their lives together. So, so that, that always sounded interesting to me. So I brought it up, and um, and he supported the idea. So I called up Louis, and I went down and I became his legislative assistant. I'm going to say this carefully, as carefully as I can. But Louis was a good public servant. He he served well, but he he wasn't my kind of type of person, and. Uh, and I guess there was some history with, with dad that I hadn't been familiar with. When dad was in office, um, Louis was, gosh, what was he, attorney general or some other position. Anyway, there was some history there. So uh, I became uncomfortable after about 10 months. And I called up dad one day and I said, dad, I just, this isn't right for me. I'm coming home. <laughs> and this is the sensitive part, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, he said, I knew if I'd done a good job raising you, that I'd be, getting, I'd be getting this call. And if I didn't get this call, then I'd figure you've just gone the way of all flesh. I'm happy to hear you. Uh, but before you come home, why don't you go over, knock on Noah's Cotton Store and see if you've got anything over there. So I did. And I'm sure he called him first to alert him and got along well and, and ended up um, not in his office, thankfully, because it was such a great opportunity to be on the Senate Commerce Committee staff. And I was in the minority office and only had about four guys to do the work of 30 over on the majority side. So even though I was not an attorney, I had some ability to write and think and negotiate, selling my ideas, uh, working with, with the opposing forces. and. Uh, became responsible for several of the subcommittees, which was just terrific as an experience. And then I left there. Um, I, I, I'm basically a New Hampshire kid and a country boy, and I was in the city, so I was anxious to go back. But I did go back and, and get involved in the, in the U.S. Senate campaign, after which I went through my decision to, that I already mentioned to come north and try life here. Well, the wisdom expressed in that story about the phone call that you made to him to tell him that you were going to be leaving the employ of 
Lewis Wyman, uh, just is really striking. That uh, you know that that he had the confidence in you to know that he, or at least believe that that at some point within a short period of time you were going to figure out this guy and uh and you were going to do the right thing and uh that 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 occurred to me so many times over the years that um he was willing to let go without prejudicing me um sent me down happy to see me get some experience but Obviously, with some reservations and concerns, and um, and he did a good job. You know, he, he raised me and gave me the values that were important to my decision, and um, thankfully did. And I I got to know over on the Senate side. I got to, to work with people like Howard Baker and Mark Hatfield and um, Senator Cotton and others who were really stellar people. Phil Hutton with the Democratic side and Chris Holland, who um, who later ran for president president and uh, it was south of North Carolina. I can't remember, but he was he was a wonderful character. I visited him when I first went down with Dad just to say hello. He was one of those that supported Dad with the chairmanship of the conference. And uh, when he was running for president, he, he came up north all by himself, went through Lancaster in the middle of the night. And in those those years Armandelli had the Lancaster food store. It was where all the Democrats gathered. Well, where everybody gathered, but it was also kind of a kind of a place for Democrats to share some points of view. And uh, just a little store, a few doors down on Main Street, which burned down subsequently. But Fitz stopped in one night, nine ten o'clock, stuck his head in the door, and he said, "Any of you guys know Peter Powell?" And I had an office just up the street, and I said, "Sure." He said, "Well, tell him Fritz Holland said to say hi." <laughs> and, and stuff. So. You can imagine that was good for a few stories when I walked in the next morning and, and uh, said hello and got my paper and uh, started to work there. It's fun, yeah. to have, fun to have people stop in small places. Well, you were, I mean, those were the giants of the Senate, those people. They were among the giants and some of the, some of the tallest. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, what a what a wonderful experience it was. Mark Hatfield um, is a is a case. I mean, they're all Howard Baker. I I wanted to support Howard for president. Reagan was running, and and uh, and I was just a kid, of course, relatively speaking. And um, Dad was supporting Reagan, and um, I went to a formative study for uh, meeting with the 15, 20 people for Baker. And it would have been awkward. And uh, Dad, the only the only time that I know of he ever influenced me in anything that I would do independently. But he said, uh, "Why don't you let me take this one? You take another one down the road." <laughs> <laughs> and, meaning being support supportive of a presidential candidate. And I was only doing it because I just thought the world of Howard Baker. Sure. And um, and. Dad was already head over heels committed to Reagan, so it would have been a little awkward. And I just kind of stood back, and so did Howard Baker. <laughs> <laughs> he really didn't really didn't uh, catch on here. I did meet um, his successor then, and then subsequently when he ran for president, the guy that had the the, uh, the red and black honey shirts. Uh, what was his name? Just another Tennessean who ran. Oh. He had huh. Oh, yeah, right, right. Uh, oh, no, I'm blanking on it, too. Yeah, so. well, I get blanking a lot of names these days, but it'll come. At any rate, uh, they were wonderful guys to work with. Hatfield, I started to say, was a deeply religious, compassionate, independent, wonderful guy. And... Um, Took his own course, you know. At times, we we think we think the controversies of today are tough, and they are. But they were also politics could be rough and tough in those days too. And uh, after I was up here working in, in this office, um, 
in my real estate business. Um, Mark had grown in seniority, but there was a big push to do two things. One was um, to have a balanced budget amendment, and the Republicans were do or die behind it. And the other had to do with a line item veto, which makes no sense in terms of the balance of power because of the way it could be abused. And whenever you think about these things, you have to think not about the guy who you who might be there and who you'd love to give power and authority to, but the guy that you don't want to be there. Right, right. And you wouldn't want some you wouldn't want the right wrong guy there with the line item veto. But the the uh, balanced budget amendment, which would have required them to balance the budget, which sounds fine in New Hampshire with 1.3 million people, doesn't work too well with 330 at the <laughs> federal level. And we can look at our debt to see how how often we have needed money in order to accomplish things. And that's a whole other debate. But I can tell you that if we didn't have stimulus programs and office spending and inflation reduction act and everything else mm -hmm. we were in a recession over the last several years for sure and states like new hampshire which benefited so much from the millions of dollars that flowed through would have been hard pressed to meet their bills um in fact um, fiscal policy is one of those passions that i have and the correction of it i think is, is tremendously important but but mark was uh was opposed to that balanced budget amendment because he could not see how it could work in times of, of need and emergency and so forth. And, and some debt in the part of the nation was certainly um, certainly supportable and necessary and critical. So he, uh, he was really under pressure. And I decided one day to call him up just to express support because I was proud of him for standing alone in opposition to it. And without him, it, the votes were pretty close. So I called and uh, called his office and he was in, on the Senate floor in the cloakroom or something. And they gave me the number, identified myself. I gave him the number and I called him. And he came to the phone and he, and he said hello with enthusiasm. We hadn't spoken for years. And, um, and he said, boys, nice to hear a friendly voice and i said well that's why i'm calling i just want to let you know how proud i am of you for the stand that you're taking and encourage you to stay in and i think it's exactly the right thing to do and i hope you can stay with it and and be successful at it and i wonder if there's anything i can do you know we i think smith was an office then maybe bob smith and, and jed gray and i said did it do any good for me to call him? Because that day, he told me that day that, that um, Senator Mack, I think he was in Florida or someplace, had gone up to him. He said, he said, uh, Sonny Mack, whatever his name was, came, came up to me in the hall today and said, if you don't change your mind, if you don't support this amendment, we're going to vote you out of the caucus today, the Republican caucus, uh, which would have been a very dramatic and rude thing to do. So I asked if there was anything I could do and whether any calls would make any difference. And he said, well, can't do any harm. So I tried calling Judd Gregg. I just talked to his AA. He wasn't available. We grew up together in the early 50s. Um, and I called Ross Smith. And, um, and I said, in both cases, here we have a guy, a veteran, someone who devoted his life to be governor of a fine state, who gave the public service years and years of devoted and wonderful attention, who's been honored and appreciated, and who deserves our respect. What if it happened to Voltaire, who said, I, I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend with my life the right to say it. He may not hold the same view as you, but he has every right to that view and deserves your respect and your support. He doesn't yeah. deserve to be voted out of the Republican Party. I never heard what either one of them did, but he was not 
voted out of the caucus and we don't have a equal rights amendment. So that was huh. just kind of a fun, a fun moment. But yeah, but um, just another indication of my belief in, in good people who really recognize what needs to be done for the common good, who commit themselves to public service, who who build community as you started with, who are part of the community, who give integrity to that community. Um, he was he was a stalwart as was Baker as was my dad. And uh, and I and I don't believe our system of government, which is under challenge now, our basic democracy as people are saying, ever realized, I never realized how completely dependent it is upon people of good character and goodwill. You never had anybody in a position of high authority who prior to Trump, if I may say so, um, thought so much of themselves and so little of their community that they were willing to sacrifice the community for the sake of self. And, and it's grown from there to this authoritarian notion and this use of government for bad purposes that um, it, it has become so frightening. But, but we never had a bad actor in a position of such authority. We had good people who may disagree and may battle and fight and argue and, and um, carry on you know, in dramatic ways at times. But at the end of the day, there was compromise. It was a win or a loss. People continued to work with each other. They didn't lose all the respect. They didn't hate each other. Um, it doesn't mean that they held hands, but they conducted themselves with good manner and with respect. And boy, that's being challenged, just as it is on our streets. You know, it, I think my mother sent me a thing one day about. Um, it starts in the home and spreads to your community and then to your state, then to your state and your nation and the world. And that is the foundations of, of goodwill and good work and uh, strong values and, and good faith in each other. So we're in a tough time. I'm glad I witnessed better times. Uh, I'm glad I had a better example. I hope that soon we can find people who will successfully provide better examples for those coming along behind us because that's good for you to see and feel and understand that. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've interviewed a couple of times this fellow who was probably there in the Senate with you as an aide, a fellow named Ira Shapiro, who has written a couple of books on, on the, uh, on the Senate. And he spoke about Mansfield in the same glowing way that that you did but that yeah i uh i look back at 94 when i ran for governor in new hampshire with your support thankfully um but uh i look at that at newt gingrich's contract with america as a real turning point in in that struggle for uh civility uh in the United States Congress, you know, to tell everybody to to treat people not as your uh, worthy adversary, but as your enemy, really made a huge difference. Um, Our um, that was that was a tough time of transition, and I think you're right. There was a transition there, and it was in relationship, and it was in attitude, and it was in um, inflexibility, um, losing the losing the will and the ability to compromise to seek the common good together. Um, I can't remember which congressman it was. Our, our mutual and good friend Michael Kitch could tell you um, that he was famous for saying, um, or I guess the comment about about him and about those people of that time was that um, they were interested. And the cost of everything, but the value of nothing. Yeah. So, so you go through with, I mean, policy should drive budgets. Budgets 
shouldn't drive policy, but you had people to whom budget was everything, cost was everything. They made it the Bible. And if you if you wanted to take care of someone who could not take care of themselves, um, then and that was your policy, then you create a budget to accomplish that. But instead, if you didn't want to raise the tax or reallocate funds, then that person who needed help was set aside. And and what is government for, really, but to reflect the need of a people to do good work together. And I think um, there are too many today who went through a period of time. Actually, I think you talk about this in the week of our conversation where um, civics learning the, the role and the processes of government were undertaught in our public school system. Maybe they still are today. Because right. when I talk about it, people people say, "Yeah, we didn't we didn't learn any of that stuff." But I I happen to mostly in in college, I guess, get into uh, political philosophy, philosophy and and the history behind our nation, the collaboration which made it possible. People have been reading Rousseau, Watt, Mills, Hobbes, mm -hmm. understanding the the tendencies of mankind, who without control or community would consume themselves as well as those who were weaker than they and who would whose appetites would would govern their behavior um, and and because which happens right now in the world with Putin's brand of imperialism for example um, if you don't have a rule of law then you have a lawless society and the way that you try to accomplish the rule of law it was decided back in the 1700s was to come together as this new nation and form a social contract, which was our constitution, ultimately. After having failed first at the Confederation, which I read the other day, Franklin dreamed up because of the uh, in the Midwest, one of the one of the uh, tribes, uh, one of the leaders of one of those tribes pulled together a federation of of other tribes and had a successful governance. And Franklin said, gee, that's what these states ought to do is have a federation. So we tried it, didn't work, came back in 87, I think, and, and formed, did the constitution. And that's our social contract. And um, that, that created the opportunity for a rule of law. I don't think the people who are causing such havoc today took those courses, read those books, understood that purpose or understand what they're flirting with as they try to take us back to a time of authoritarianism, the very thing that was opposed by the founding fathers as they left England and elsewhere to come to a place where, where the people could do it. And, um, and all the heroes of that day, you know, not perfect men either, but um, good thinkers who compromised and found a way to make this government work. Um, that's that that bit of knowledge and that closeness to the cause and the reason why it had to happen seems lost on all these folks, many of these folks. And I and I don't understand why um, why the allegiance we've always had to the foundations of our country and our democracy um, is, has become so weak and seems to be disappearing among some segments of our ruling class. You know, it's really, really unfortunate. I think the stresses have always been there, but the distance that's growing between the haves and the has not have nots, um, the political parties, um, the extremisms of everything from religion to political practice are shocking and threatening the, the foundation of the country. I don't think I've ever been more concerned this is the time I live in, so God knows how I would have felt about some other time. Certainly the Civil War was a test. But and we've always met those tests in our in our history. And I hope that we have the strength and the wisdom to do so again. And it needs people to be informed and aware fully of good good facts, good data, clear understanding. Right. Uh, and that's one of the that's one of the reasons I think why we're struggling today is that, that doesn't exist. 
So you, uh, when I look at your uh, list of accomplishments in your life, there's so many times when, you know, people in high office turn to you as a person to represent, uh, represent uh, the citizens of the state of New Hampshire, whether it was you know, looking at tax issues or looking at conservation and um, all of those things, but you you never you know jumped into the into the arena of elected politics. Did you make a conscious choice about that uh, that has something to do with the life that you chose? Um, it's interesting because I think I think it was after that campaign when I came back to New Hampshire and had the campaign, I was just deciding, trying to decide what to do. I was approached by um, a few kingmakers down in Rockingham County, and Louis Wyman was going to be running for the Senate and, and leading the congressional seat, and they uh, they said, we think that you should run for Congress, and I was 26 years old, I think, and my response was a little surprised. I mean, it, I'd just been involved in the campaign and my dad was well known. But I said, don't you think I should live life a while before I start deciding how others see this? <laughs> um, you know, I've got a lot to learn and I'm not sure that you want someone with so much to learn sitting in a place where they're going to be trying to tell other people what to do. And that was an honest reflection of exactly how I felt. I then started to raise a family. I know that Political life is stressful on family. Uh, life is stressful enough as it is on families, and I didn't want to challenge mine in that day, in that way in the early days. Um, and then there was the idea that that when it comes to fiscal policy and various other things, I'm I'm fairly progressive, and I believe in tax reform, and I think it's critical that we face that and deal with it soon because we have so many challenges that it's worth another half hour conversation about what those challenges are. But we need to gather up our resources. We have the resources. We're a strong and successful state, um, wealthy. We just don't have the courage to gather them up and commit them to the, to the good public purposes for which they should be intended. Um, but I was approached by, uh, so, I'm, so I'm, let's just say I'm a little progressive. <laughs> and it isn't easy, is it, to get elected if you're in that category historically in New Hampshire. And I certainly couldn't take the press. But I was approached by two, again, probably in my mid-30s by now, two attorneys older than I by considerable years in a very prestigious firm in Manchester. And uh, I had gotten to know them both. And they, I think they had me stop in in Manchester. And they said basically that together that they wanted me to get myself ready to, to run for governor. And one of them said, very experienced and very um, successful guy, so highly regarded, you know, not just as a Republican person, which he was, but also as a um, fellow who did so much for his community, raising funds for a good purpose. Um, but he said, he said to me, you know, you may have to um, put up with some people you don't want to put up with, and say some things you don't want to say, and do some stuff you don't want to do. But if you can do that, you can be elected. And I looked at him and said, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. <laughs> and um, and I couldn't. I mean, there's no way I could do that. It just wouldn't work. And um, and he said, well, that's too bad. And he was kind of offended. I can remember it in his eyes. I mean, he'd gone out of his way to offer me his support and help and everything. And I just basically turned him down. Felt bad about that, but not about my attitude because uh, why in the hell would you want to take on a public office like that? With so many needs so apparent and preclude your ability to do the right thing when you get there. So um, 
the bottom line to all that is that throughout all these years, I've probably been inelectable, unelectable. Um, wouldn't have won, would have had a, had a great time trying probably, but um, when you consider the stresses on family and, and the diversion of energies and attention from things that you have to do to create your, uh, your life and your estate, um, I think that was the right decision for me. And I get very passionate about policy. I don't know where I'd be on administration. I'd have to have some really good people working for me to make something like that work. But I think it, it just wasn't the right thing for me, and, and, uh, and I haven't done it. Well, I suppose the difference between us, Peter, was that I was stupid enough to try. <laughs> well, you, you, had, you had been did a wonderful job in the Senate. You were a leader of the Senate, and, and I was very proud of you. We used to, if I was down there, you know, we were hanging out together because I was appointed by Harold Burns to be on the, uh, the commission that we had to do a strategic plan, economic plan for New Hampshire. And we got a little progressive in the plan. It never got anywhere. But we would have our sessions, and, um, and they were really a lot of good work was being done. Well, we also had a great time visiting afterwards before yeah. everybody went home. And that's that's where you find, you know, that's where people are missing that opportunity to to network and get to know each other and understand common points of value and and uh, mission goals and everything and to reveal themselves as people. I think that's that's what's missing from some of the work in Congress and in, in, in here in New Hampshire. Um, but we enjoyed it. We had a great time, and um, and I respected you then. I respect you now, and I and I um, I wish that you had been successful. Um, and it's and it's not for everybody. It is for some people. I mean, you, you did a great job with what you did, and and uh, who knows what would have happened to me. Well, thank you, Peter. Um, I I think. Uh... I would love to go on for another hour with you, but I think maybe uh, I want to think a little more about uh, doing this again for another hour in a month or so. Oh, I'd love to do that. And then you've got the problem of pulling things together, but um, I, I think that would be fun. And I've had a few thoughts that I've shoved aside just because of time, um, but it would be fun to do anytime you'd like to. Good. Good. Uh, so, Peter Powell, thank you so much for taking this time to speak with me about your life and your family and the importance of community. And thank you for all that you do for uh, so many folks uh, here in New Hampshire and elsewhere. You take care, my friend. Thank you, man. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.